And hello, we're back here with coverage of the Tencent LPL Summer. We're in week three, day two, and our second match of the day here, LMQ up against Royal. And it should be, as always, some excellent matches here. My name is Pastry Time, and I'm joined by Papa Smithy. Papa, a great day one yesterday. Kicked off game two with a pretty interesting game there between Positive Energy and OMG. What do you think we're going to see here with LMQ versus Royal? I think Royal will be really motivated here to get back into that joint second place. You know, they were the one team who came into yesterday four and two that lost. You know, they lost to... Uh, positive energy in a pretty close game. They, they, they went for that four assassin comp that was just something you almost never see in competitive. It didn't quite work. So they'll fancy their chances against LMQTC here, but definitely no pushes, pushovers, as of course the LMQ squad does have the core tenants of the Livermore squad that has, has that experience from the previous LPL split. Funnily enough, though, LMQ respecting the picks from day, day one here. Cassidy and Fizz both both banned out. And, of course, Uzi get, uh, Uzi's Caitlyn getting banned out there as well as their three bands. Over on the other side, a little, little more standard here. Elise and Rai going to get the chop. And Oriana as well. Don't want to see her in this one. And Thresh is the first pick up here. I guess, you know, we have Zach open. We've seen him be pretty popular. Certainly a lot of other champions that could be picked up here by LMQ. But they are going to go with Thresh here to start things off. You know, Thresh, that playmaking support, so strong. But I do like these Caitlyn bands. It's not like Uzi is a one-trick pony in the slightest. He is one of the best AD carries in the world, let alone China. But Royal has looked best in this summer split of the LPL when he's been able, when Royal been able to take down those three turrets really early because of Caitlyn's siege potential. And it's all about Uzi winning lane, pushing down turrets, rotating mid and top, and then from there, you know, aggressive warding and pushing for the win. But taking that away from Uzi means that he has to default someone like Vayne, who, of course, has a, a completely different set of uh, issues for the LMQ squad. Still is that high, but carry still is super strong, but not as strong in that sieging potential. Yeah, I like this uh, Nunu pick up here as well from Royal. We've seen that from uh, from Lucky, who... Is he... No, he didn't. Never mind. Get Getting confused players there. He did not name change. But Lucky, I believe, was playing Nunu yesterday, and it makes sense to support a player like Uzi with a champion like Nunu just to make that Blood Bowl and give that AD carry an even bigger push over the top there. You know, if Vayne isn't already a hyper carry, then uh, Nunu just makes that even better there by increasing all that ability. So nice to see those two picks there. Could even be support Nunu, something we haven't seen for a little while. Over on the LMQ side, we've got Jarvan again from No Name here. Seems to like that one. And Zed's going to make yet another appearance here. And lucky, you know, the Nunu's a different flavor to the previous time these two teams met, as on the first day of the split of the LPO, there was the Royal versus LMQ game, where Lucky was 7-0-1 on Lee Sin before 15 minutes. He was massive on Lee Sin, playmaking and picking up kills. This time, probably going to be that Nunu pick. Be a bit more of a utility pick, but... Of course, Uzi will love him for it. Yes, and with Nami and Zaki, it looks like Nunu is going to be going into the jungle there. I mean, always, you know, always have to be careful as an enemy jungler as well against Nunu. I mean, Jarvan, not too bad against someone like Nunu, but have to be careful getting all your stuff taken away because it's uh, very important that you try and keep your jungle as best you can. Looks like LMQ going to finish up their lineup with Twitch, which is going to be the pick up here as their AD carry. And Cannon is their last pick in there as well. So good amount of AoE there to follow it up. And, I, you know, very standard, very balanced team, it seems like, for LMQ. And this is definitely going to be the Macnoon school of cannon in that they're going to have Jarvan, Thresh, and Cannon all in the front lines trying to AoE CC and disrupt for Twitch to put out that spray and frame and really wreck a team fight. You can see what team fights look at. And they actually have very strong 4v4 LMQ here, which is important because if you have strong 4v4 and a Zed, Zed can go and split and in most cases are going to be stronger than anyone on the enemy team here in terms of 1v1. And if you can engage or hold off or have strong wave clear, and basically be a very strong 4v4 team, the Zed can really be just the icing on the cake for a team comp. Yeah, and uh, last pick, Ari there as well, going to be there for Royal. So White's kind of sticking to his assassin sort of flavor there for his mid-champions. And we've mentioned Ari before, she's very, very powerful, one of those champions. It's kind of almost seen a little renaissance in play, it feels like, which is nice to see her kind of back into the scene again. But Ari is very, very scary in almost any lane. And, you know, if she gets ahead especially, it's lights out when she gets DFG for basically anyone on the enemy team. You know, I went into depth about the Zed playstyle. There's actually four champions in this game that kind of operate on that wavelength. We're probably going to see Triple Bay the Ruin King in terms of Zed, Twitch, and uh, Vayne all very likely to pick up Blade the Ruin King, which of course gives you very strong dueling potential with that active. And White's here probably going to stick with the Ambition Blaze build of the DFG first on Ari, which is very similar. You can camp a brush as Ari, and if you hit a charm in DFG, you're going to be able to do just as well as a Zed would play their own king. So a lot of dueling potential, a lot of skirmish. Oh, oh bad news there for LMQ. Thresh going to get himself caught out. Snowball in there. There's all Charm just missing there for Whites. And Uzi's going to get the damage in. There's a flash full start. A slingshot actually used there from Godlike. 
him wanting to get in and try and pick up a kill, but the flash there from Thrash pretty much going to shut that down. And uh, very nice moves there from Royal, mo moving through their own tribal there, try and get someone down. A couple, couple of members checking out there for LMQ, almost gets themselves killed, throws a ward down, but there's the pink ward down to clear that one out, and Royal will keep vision of their side of the jungle. Yeah, absolutely. They come out from this level one with the ward advantage and also the the flash down on the enemy support. So Royal win that level one heads up, I have to say. Yeah, I mean, you know, Zach, I guess he's lightning actually, so it doesn't matter too much that he's got Slingshot as his first skill. And it uh, looks like Lucky is actually going to go ahead and start on the red side of his jungle. It is something that could be punished. It's the same as if a support nooner back in the day would take consume level one. If you know that information, then you know that you can win a 2v2 skirmish. Yeah, of course, Lucky with the snowball now as well, which he used. But, you know, he's going to get some help. It looks like Royal going to probably start off with a lane swap here. As, uh, everyone, everyone's hanging around the red buff here. Not quite. At some point, we just need to be excited when the lanes don't swap pastry time. That's true. Oh, it's standard again. Amazing. And it looks like Lucky's going to stay as red buff. Now, there we go. Red's going to spawn up, and they're going to take that one away. And get a bit of help here. Probably do a, this one smiteless if he wants to. And then he can rush off and do whatever he wants from there. Jarvan actually going to do the same here. And uh, no name's going to pick up his red buff very quickly, actually, with, with his smite as well. And, and yeah, it's going to be a 2v2 in the top lane here, which... I guess it's fairly standard at this point. I mean, it's it's standard in terms of 2v2, you know, 2 one, one matchups. I mean, inverted in terms of the map, but still 2v1, 2 one, one in terms of the solo lanes. Yeah, I like to call it the Australian meta. You know, it's the standard, but just flipped upside down. Absolutely. I'll, I'll give you that one. It's a nice one. And uh, so 2v2 up in the top there. Looks like Cannon's going to be down the bottom there. Up against... Where has he gone here? Is Ari. He's uh, taking a bit of a bidding there from Zed. See White's before, just earlier, doing what he could. Looks like Zack, sorry, is the one that's rotating through. So Godluck's going to have to run down to that bottom lane. He's a little late to his own party, unfortunately. I believe he cleared a camp to try and get a level advantage in what he assumed was going to be a 2v1 situation. But with the lane swap, he is losing out on experience quite drastically here. Yeah, it looks like Dreams is actually going to be able to push in this tower as well. I think Zack's going to make it in time for the experience as he comes in, because Cannon can't quite push those waves down yet. But uh, not the best start there for God. Like he's, as I said, a little late there. As it can. It's often something that you know, picking up that camp at 155, then going bot is often a master stroke, just because teams will either hold the wave or not be able to push in fast enough. So by the time, you know, in a 1v2 situation, the creeps reach the experience range that you're expecting, you have that extra camp and didn't lose anything. But they kind of thought they were getting a swap they didn't get. And so that's why they can't, he's a bit caught out here, Godlike. Godlike, he's a level behind at this point here, so... You know, he's going to start things off a little less exciting, but he is Zach. Definitely pretty safe. I imagine he won't have too much trouble down there in the bottom lane. And we're going to set up for our first game here. I can just spot no name there coming through. Uzi looking to get with the Kadeva, but no name's going to get the knock up there. Flash out there as well, but the damage is coming through there. And it may just be enough. The barrier actually activated. Avenger going very aggressive. They're trying to pick up the kill. And Deadly Venom's enough to claim it there. Very aggressive flash there as Thresh comes in to extract no name out as well. Now Lucky coming through. Aquapacet is good though. Nunu forced to flash out there as well as no name comes back looking for the second EQ combo. And that was very ballsy there for LMQ, but they're going to be very happy to pick up first blood. And you always have to be, you have to always check yourself page time if you try and 2v2 a Twitch early in lane, just because that deadly venom, you might as well have ignite, that's the kind of effect you get having that passive. Yeah, absolutely, that true damage there, ticking away and expunged to so much damage as well in trades, so, I mean, Twitch, not a champion, no, maybe as Tubby, he could be in trouble, that three-man dive coming through, another kill there for Avenger, and that's real bad news for Royals top lane there, is that now both members of the duo have been killed. And LMQ, a really big early start here. Yeah, they want to get their third win on the board here this of this uh, LPL summer, and they're doing a fantastic job so far. And Twitch, very scary. As I was saying, not a champion you normally associate with aggressive level 2 or 3 all ins, but really that expunge just does so much work. And you can see it there, all that damage that Twitch did early on, and then just enough there to flash after the barrier wore off from Uzi, and then to clean up the kill. He's going to come back to lane. Oh my goodness, he has a build to water cutlass. And now you already have that ambush potential. You don't, you don't quite have the Blade of the Ruin Kings, you know, to be able to ambush on top of someone, then slow them, but... You still have this small slow that comes out of bilge water, and it's still a really, really potent thing. So, Uzi now on the back foot already. Yeah, I mean, I like to think of bilge water as kind of a super vampire acceptor, and that's basically what Twitch is coming back to. That's how it builds as well, yeah. so uh, definitely. You don't need to think too hard to, to come to that conclusion. No. There's a, re there's a reason I didn't have to think too hard, which is good. <laughs> I, things get bad when I have to think too hard. But oh, it, don't, be, don't be harsh on yourself, bitch time. That's my job. <laughs> it is indeed. But Twitch going to come back to lane with a very nice advantage here at five minutes. Here is Dreams down the bottom, almost going to get himself initiated on. Lucky hanging around the bottom there as well, trying to get some work done, but not going to happen here. Jarvan continuing to stay active here as well. 
And it's kind of interesting, I guess Nunu was nerfed a couple times after the recent jungle changes, but, you know, he's not quite the super counter jungling powerhouse we know him as. Well, this is the 3.9 patch, so it's still Nunu's happy days here. You know, it's not 3.10 where, you know, Nunu will have to clear that second minion and not just the big buff to hit level 2. Nunu's still really strong, it's just the teams at this point have been exposed to him on the 3.9 patch, and I guess 3.8 at all, long enough to know what he's all about. It's not really been many sneaky Nunu stealing a buff away and getting three buffs at the uh, first rotation anymore. Yeah, that's true. And kind of, you know, the thing about Nunu that is always going to be true is that he has probably the smoothest transition from, you know, from jungle phase to teamfight phase. And, you know, he's almost like a second support, really. That's a lot of... Exactly. His build is very cheap. You know, you get, I guess, you know, a spirit item and then some cooldown reduction as we see. Oh, in mid lane, we have a trade here. Yeah, it looks like Deathbound going to come through there. Wyatt's actually going to Spirit Rush out of the way, but damage coming through there as well. One more tick, he does have the charge. Lucky coming through as well. The charm just going to miss out there as a living shadow there gets Xiao Wei Xiao out of the way. And that was a really nice trade. They've really creative use of Spirit Rush there from White to try and kind of re-all in that Zed after using that death mark. But uh, both mid laners are going to stay alive for just a little while longer. And still only the two kills on the board for LMQ. And Zhao Wei Zhao actually loses out there on the Zed quite significantly because he had to pop the red pot during that trade. That's 350 gold that is used on that consumable compared to the no consumables on Ari's side. And he's behind in CS. So he's got less gold and he's used his gold on a consumable. So he's going to hit that kind of mid-game power spike that Zed hits when he gets to the Rune King just that much later than maybe Ari will hit her DFG power spike. Yeah, I like this build here from White. I mean, it makes sense to go for Seeker's Unguard. We've got double Doran's double cloth armor here for Ari, so really just wants to make sure that, hey, you can't kill me and land in, I think. Yeah, and it might not be the Rush Zonias, but yeah, I mean, Seeker's is such a sleek item. It builds so well. It fills its niche so well, but it's nice as a early game pickup. Yeah, and really, you know, you're going to be able to protect yourself from any all-ins like just happened there. So, you know, Zed going to struggle a little here to probably kill this Aryan lane, but if he's getting farm, he's okay with that, and he can transition, of course, into that Blade of the Ruin King into Split Push that we almost always see from Zed's in competitive play. So, you know, he still does his job well, he's just, you know, not going to be the super aggressive AD assassin that he can be, sometimes in mid lane as well. And with the 2-0 here, we can see on the minimap they are going to be trying to force a dragon here. Yep, it's already very low. Going to be a free dragon for LMQ here. <laughs> And uh, yeah, at this early stage, it's looking like an upset. They are ahead. LMQ with a really nice rotation there, actually. Looks like Uzi, they're going to try and all in Dreams, who does flash out of the way there. So Kennedy came to the top lane, rotates the others down the bottom, so they pick up Dragon, as you said, Papa. Nice and quick here at around 8 minutes 20. Lucky actually doing a little bit of counter juggling of his own, trying to take away this blue buff. Cavalry's coming. It is indeed. This could be bad news here. And there's the ultimate coming out from Kennen. Lucky activates absolute zero. Death Knight coming through as well. He's forced the flagship, but White with a great charm onto Dreams. But everyone else is trying to get out here. The stun out onto White. Hook just missing out there for Ari as well. And they need a little more. If they can get a condemn there onto Zhao Wei Zhao. Almost enough, but maybe one more auto to proc that Silver Bolts could have done it. And LMQ going to walk away. In fact, everybody going to walk out here. Royal very happy to not get anyone killed, but Zack still down the bottom line pushing here as well as Dreams run towards that tower to try and save it. But a win for them there didn't get themselves picked off despite a bit of an awkward position and if they get this tower that's kind of going to equalize the dragon gold they just lost but god like sadly still has to do a little bit more work to get that done and that's the second time in a handful of minutes that both Zhao Wei Zhao and Wyatt's here have been so low on their champions they've been so close to picking up a kill but only that early skirmishing up top has led to anything in this game. Yeah. And I like that, you know, LMQ realized they needed to rotate down bottom for the dragon, so sent Cannon up the top, you know, did a pretty comfortable three-man dragon, felt like they had a good position. Uh, were kind of nice timing on the map to pick that one up. They've actually just gone ahead and swapped back at this point. So, you know, they don't want to put Cannon in a situation where the tower that he's trying to defend, 2v1, is getting overpressured. Now Cannon's down the back, uh, down the bottom, he's up against Zack again, which he seems to have a very comfortable matchup with at this point here. And, you know, they've got their very strong Twitch and their strong Thresh back up in the top lane, pressuring yet another the turret. Yeah, it's a very defensive build coming out from Kennen. He's got the two Dorans for laning, but he's got the Negatron cloak here. Nobody's going to be killing anyone down bottom lane. No, Godlike actually comes coming back now with a giant spell to follow up with that chain vest, so he's going to feel very, very safe there down the bottom as well. I guess it's just a matter of, you know, Avengers kind of started nicely. He's actually got three daggers, by the way. Two for Blade of the Rune King and one for his Berserker Greaves, but uh, that's very cost-efficient attack speed, which will actually help him push here in this situation. Shall we, shall we? Looking frisky. Oh, finds Nunu, then goes over the top like he's like, oh, I did not sign up for this. Throws out a snowball and looks like that's going to be He just wanted to judge his damage. He was like, nope, I'm not going to be able to kill this tanky Nunu. Yeah, might as well surprise him. Maybe, you know, if he gets a heart attack and can't use his keyboard anymore, you'll get a free kill, but just casually getting in there, getting out when he needs to. You have to, to put yourself in the potential to get those kills if the heart attack happens. Absolutely. You really need to be there. You know, nothing ventured, nothing gained. No, and uh, 
in, a, in amongst it all as well, the top tower does go down as well. So mission accomplished there for LMQ, getting that first tower there. Of course, they're two kills up ahead now as well. And of course, Avenger, who's really started this game off with a bang, can continue roaming and try and get someone done. Because if there's an AD carry that roams effectively, it's Twitch. Absolutely, the ambush gives you that movement speed. You don't even need the boots to be able to roam the map. And if you can ever get yourself in a favorable position, you can do some huge trade damage, but he's in trouble. Yeah, he's actually uh, getting snowballed up here. There fades away with the ambush, but pink one being put down, forced to flash out of the way. The lantern in there as well as No Name looks for the counter initiation. Very smart ward there from Royal, but unfortunately not enough there. Pretty much the one CC they needed to land. I guess they had Nami in there as well for Bubble, but couldn't quite land any of the stuns there. Just the snowball coming out onto Twitch. And they would have loved that kill onto Avenger, but kind of have to back away now. Cannon up in the top, looking aggressive here, just trying to trade against his Zack. And you know, Zack, for all his very strong passive farming sort of ability, he obviously doesn't really want to fight this Cannon 1v1. It's still a melee versus uh, ranged matchup from the Zack's perspective, so he's still going to be always functioning on, you know, a half HP, but oh, we could have it. Uh, could have something here. Actually going in, Lucky wrapping on the bottom there as well. Slicey Maelstrom getting activated there as well. Absolute zero that's going to cut off to retreat. That's bad news there for Dreams. Another slow there. The Q comes out for that stretching strike. And I think Dreams is going to be dead here. You can see support coming back. White's maybe thinking that, hey, if I need to be here, maybe I can pick up a kill. Maybe I got myself an assist. But a nice wrap around there from Nunu is going to be the end of Dreams down the bottom lane. And first kill on the board for Royal. Maybe give them a little bit more momentum back in this early game. And as that duel was happening, I looked at the map and no wards on the bottom side of the map. So definitely the moment that he used his uh, lightning rush aggressively, he was in a real world of hurt. And unfortunately did not work out there. For the bottom lane there, Dreams. He's going to force to come back off the respawn. Avenger here, very aggressive. Maybe one more auto would have been the kill on Oh, That looked quite close there, but Tower's going to go down the bottom lane as well. Going to even that one up. Two for one now in turrets. As they look to get some more gold. You know, despite the early game deficit with Twitch looking very scary, in fact, he already has a Blade of the Ruin King, which is really, really bad business here for Royal Club fans. But, you know, I think Royal have kind of... Damage control was... Act, uh, they kind of really minimized the damage after those first two kills here. And, you know, just kind of playing everything and keeping themselves back in this game with some really smart objective play. Absolutely. There hasn't been any snowball, despite the fact that Twitch came back with that, with a bilge water cutlass at you know an outrageously early time. It's only the dragon, the first dragon, that they were able to get down really early. Maybe Royal won't have a timer for that dragon just because it was killed so early. So if they can snowball that into a second dragon, then LMQ will be you know decently happy. But for now, they've been well held. Yep, dragon two back in a minute or less. It'll be interesting to see if Royal. Know that time is coming and position themselves accordingly. Blue buff here, going to get donated over as well. Ari's going to pick that one up, so Whites will be happy there. Building up towards I, any number of items, maybe even an Abyssal Scepter actually with that Blasting Wand, although Blasting Wand kind of builds into everything, so I think Ari's going to have... But not a DFG. No, not a DFG is, is kind of the interesting one, I guess, because that's definitely the item you'd almost expect at this point. It's, the, it's definitely the item du jour for the uh, Ari players. Yes. I mean, I think it's certainly an item that you need to time in a nice window. You know, we talk about Rod of Ages timing. I think DFG certainly has a timing where, you know, you need this at a point where you can go ahead and just blow somebody up and really start the snowball going. So maybe White's is like, eh, probably not going to get there. I'll go for something like an Abyssal, which is very good in Ari also. Or, you know, probably not Void stuff, but you could just build a rabbit on here as well. Maybe just once. Speaking of timings, though, the 14 minute Blade of the Ruin King does come out from Zed. You can see with that double Blade of the Ruin King, if LMQ can force a fight, you know, if this, at this next dragon, they've certainly got the items to back up their early game. They should be able to force one very, very soon here. In fact, I believe it may even be started here by Royal, and this could be very, very bad news. They're going to try and finish off half health there for the dragon. But Jarvan's going to try and get in there. Cuts him off a great cataclysm. Decent tidal wave as well. Thresher wants to pull himself in. The box gets activated there. So Godlike in the back trying to pick up Avenger, but a great ult there from Dream's going to shut everybody down. Condemn back there as Whites gets stunned up as well. Godlike's now very low as he gets popped into Bloblets. And LMQ going to look to try and get some exit kills here. They'll get one onto Zach. Everybody on Royal so obscenely low, other than Uzi, who's kind of a little late to the party. I mean, LMQ feel a little hard done by to not get more kills, but exactly what they need there. One kill and a dragon, they'll take it. And it was just the item space, Jatan. The item advantage meant that if there were ever going to be a fighter dragon, it was going to go to LMQ, but it wasn't the ace that it potentially could have been. So damage minimization there. Royal tried to sneak the dragon, got caught with their pants down, but only the dragon and one kill it's loss minimization for them. Yeah, and I think that really is the story of Royal's early game here. I mean, you know, things weren't going too well on the top lane, and they've really just tr made sure they didn't fall too far behind, because that's the other thing about Snowball. Once it keeps once it keeps going and gets bigger and bigger, it's harder and harder to stop as it rolls down the hill. So Royal, to their credit, are doing a good job not putting themselves in situations where horrible things happen, just bad things. And professional players talk about that, that, you know, level one can decide games at points, and that's, you know, before minions even spawn. So you can see how a double kill for a Twitch really early can warp a game. 
it's definitely given LMQ probably more early to mid game presence than Royal would have expected. But they're only 4k gold behind right now. It's certainly a big lead for for 15 minutes, but it's definitely not going to decide the game just yet. We'll have to see what LMQ do now, because, you know, they kind of got their major items, the double blade of the Ruin Kings happened, they had Dragon come up, which they secured then after getting that kill. Really, at this point, you know, the plan has to be Zed split push, right? Yeah, and he's top lane, and Vayne backs away, knowing that she cannot stay in a lane against a level 11 Zed with Blade of the Rune King. Dreams coming in the bottom lane as well. Godlike going to slingshot himself out there, but Dreams continues to show presence here as he builds up towards... Uh, I guess he's building a bit of everything right now. He kind of has half an Abyssal and half a Zonius. Yeah, he just picked up that uh, Nisa Large Rod for the Dragon fight, you know, just wanting the damage for it. The Royal, actually, with the map movement here, uh, not quite going to be able to take down the mid turret, but nice little adaptation for Royal. Yeah, LMQ, you know, maybe looking to get in there. Javan actually can look for the Cataclysm Death Arc on top in there as well. The Tidal Wave coming through. White's over the top. They're trying to get it done. A great absolute zero there from Nunu. Shuts out that Javan initiation. And Avenger not quite here yet. That's a good flash play, though, out from Thresh. So, and Avenger going to take some damage. Cannon out coming through as well. Will stun up Uzi. And that's real bad news there for Vayne, who's going to go down. Good charm, though, coming out for White. And plays left, right, and standing here. Nami with a good bubble as well. Going to pick up Xiao Wei Zhao. And Royal here trying to make it happen. In fact, it's four for one. And Thresh is going to complete the ace in there as well. So, LMQ, a five. Five for two fight overall. Started with a decent idea, a great shutdown of the Java initiation, and despite some really, really strong positioning from LMQ, Royal do pull that one out there. Yeah, and the momentum starts to shift there. Unfortunately, Avenger was caught in the middle of AoE, in the middle of the fight, against highly mobile champions like Ari, and he was caught out, and that's where all the gold is right now on LMQ. They don't necessarily have a landslide winning fight win after Zed's ultimate's down and Twitch is dead. Yeah, so. And a very nice little momentum shift for Royal here. This makes the next dragon oh so much more interesting. You can see the gold gap closed pretty rapidly in there as well. We were about 4,000 a few minutes ago. We're just 2,000 now between these two teams, or just under. So, I mean, Tabe and White's been playing together for quite a while. They really teamed up there with Lucky to get a lot of work done. You know, Uzi couldn't quite make something happen. Cannon trickled in and really put Vayne out of position. But just some stunning AoE there between Absolute Zero and Spirit Rush. And that was really, really nice to watch there from Royal. That was... Again, Javan being a little too eager, but that could have gone, again, really horribly wrong if things had fallen a little bit better into place. So for LMQ, and look at Twitch here. Still aggressive here. I mean, you said it. He's the one with the gold. He's happy to 1v1 this vein right now. And, the f and they both have Blade of the Ruin King, but the person who blinks first, the person who gets to Blade of the Ruin King down first, has that innate advantage there. Even though Vayn is the queen of duels, Twitch could have picked it up there, but under turret, just a little bit too much aggression required. Yeah, Avenger just... Backs off there, Kunk doesn't quite want to commit to that dive there, just, you know, scares off Uzi. He'll walk away, looks like he's going to go do some jungle here. Lucky actually in the mid, activates his ultimate, I think he was hoping to trap somebody out there. Looks like White's activate ultimate, looking for the charm into the absolute zero, but LMQ managed to escape that one there in the mid lane. As we've seen, No Name has himself a locket and an oracle, so definitely LMQ can start to look for some more aggressive map movement. This is kind of the time, you know, around the 20 minute mark where teams do like to get kind of roam through, you know, they've usually got some towers down at this point. Obviously it's two for two right now in terms of turrets, so once that map, once that, that part of the map's been opened up, you can definitely look to start get some more picks and maybe group together in threes, in fours, or maybe even as five, although with the Zed, I imagine I'll be looking for the four man here. It feels like the rush to Bulwark will happen for Java next. That item pick up against the fairly, I guess, you know, the, the double AP com combo. It's just a soft double AP given that it's a, uh, a t very tanky Zack top, but the, the Bulwark will definitely help. LMQ immensely. I mean, we talked about Royals' last team fight that they won very handily there. A lot of that was to do with, you know, White's and Lucky's ultimates. Oh, uh, so I guess ultimates for Ari and her other abilities. Plus no, that's the a good point. I mean, Absolute Zero's base damage is massive. It is indeed massive, and Lucky's been positioning very nicely for those. So, I mean, Bulwark is definitely going to help, even against Zack, but especially, and against Ari, but I think especially against Nunu in this situation as well. Royal, to their credit, though, notice Twitch is down the bottom, going to take out this top turret here. And continue to stay even here again. Damage control seems to be the name of the game here for Royal. And for a game that was looking like it might get out of hand, they're actually doing a nice job here, but they are really going to power push here. Twitch still down the bottom lane here is going to look to push another tier two. I mean, with Ambush with Blade of the Rune King and the Zeal there, Twitch can push down turrets very fast. Just a matter of what Royal can do here. Knock up there. Gets on the shallow Shall the tidal wave follow up as well. But Dreams there looks for the counter initiation as Cataclysm comes through as well. White so dodging there back and forth with the Spear Rush. After Zero getting activated in there as well. They need a bit more damage. Great Zon is there from White as Shall Shall tries to pop it. 
him off. The Deathmark pops there, is still in stasis, which is not going to work out, but Royal needs to keep going here. Dreams gets Uzi very, very low as the life steals just enough to keep Vayne alive. Tabe's going to go down as well there as Thresh will pick up that kill, but Twitch is still pushing here, by the way. That was a very nice 4v5 from LMQ, and Avengers still doing damage here. And I thought that Dreams ultimate would have been just enough disruption to buy time and stop any LMQ people from dying, but they did take a lot of deaths for that. But it's a wonderful trade from their perspective, as they get damage on the inhibitor, but importantly the inhibitor turret down, all from the solo push from Avenger. Avenger forced to back here as Nami's coming through, Godlike went back to defend as well. So, uh, you know, Royal did have that defense for their inhibitor, they won't lose that, but, you know, trading a tier 2 for that inhibitor turret, definitely not an even trade here, LMQ gonna be happy with that, and despite some great play there from Royal to not get completely destroyed in that team fight, Dreams really did buy some time there, and uh, everyone just kind of did what they needed to do and say, you know what, we're committed to putting Avenger down the bottom and letting him split push, let's buy him as much time as possible. And I guess the issue here is, do the kills that Royal picked up change how the next team fight looks? Because of course there is that extra gold on some of the carries. Dragon getting get picked up here as well. I think Nunu's going to look to maybe Smiter doesn't quite get there. The Jarvan could be trapped. He's going to EQ his way out there as Twitch rides the lantern out of the back of Dragon. So very and Dragon sticky. puts the gold back in LNQ's advantage. You mean they were 2,000 gold ahead before, now they're a little bit more, 3,000 ahead, so they pick up. I was just thinking in terms of that trade of, you know, three kills and a turret for two turrets, and now also the, the dragon is just a little bit more gold from that oh, one or yeah. two minutes of play. Absolutely, so, you know, the kills obviously adding up in terms of gold, but objectives bouncing out just slightly ahead there for LMQ. You know, I mean, they'll take it. That bottom inhibitor is very, very tasty looking if you're, uh, if you're on LMQ. I mean... They could potentially even have Twitch do some backdooring. It's not, you know, as obnoxious as it used to be, back with one minute or so of stealth. But, you know, we could see some sneakiness here. And if you're ever going to be able to pressure an area on the map, I think if you're LMQ on the blue side, it's going to be that bottom side that you really want to take advantage of because that leaves Baron wide open on the left side of the map. Absolutely. And maybe they'll put some smart pink words down. Because, I mean, although you can't stealth to the inhibitor as fast, you now get the attack speed buff instantly when you fade from stealth. So you can kind of just toggle stealth on and off to get the 80% attack speed buff from ambush. So, in some ways that backdooring was enough, but in some ways it's actually been strengthened. Yeah, certainly the upfront attack speed you get is much higher than it used to be. You don't have to wait in stealth anymore. I mean, pink wards here for Royal, they're actually setting up a lot of them here, despite having an oracles. So they've chucked down pink wards plenty. They just want ideas on Twitch's positioning, rather than just being able to get on in onto Twitch when he's in ambush. Absolutely. And that, you know, may just be playing to Avenger's tendencies. Not every Twitch player is aggressive with their ambush, but I think Avenger, especially in this spot, lives Blade of the Ruin King is going to look to be a little friskier than most, shall we say, and it's really smart from Royal to have that covered, of course. You know, they need... They're clearly showing that they are mostly concerned about Baron here in this instance, and with all the warding they're doing, with the Oracles, with how grouped they're staying here at this point of the map, makes perfect sense, because they really do need to make sure Baron doesn't get stolen away. With the strength of their 4v4, though, I'd actually like to see Zhao Wei Zhao go bottom and try and pressure this inhibitor, just because he's Zed, he's got the Blade of the Ruin King, the Last Whisperer, and a, and a Longsword now. He does have immense split push pressure, and I feel like their 4v4, especially with Baron aggroing on Royal, if they did hit the Baron, is pretty strong. So I'm surprised to see Zed just remaining grouped here. Yeah, it's almost like they've taken their Zed pick, he's gotten decent fun, but they haven't really committed to the, you know, four top, one bottom, or however they want to kind of split it out. But, I mean, Royal... Well, you definitely want the one bottom game this game, just because the yes. inhibitor is free, basically. <laughs> I mean, it was kind of weird that the Avenger of all people was the one that happened to be down there starting a split push, where you kind of expect Zed traditionally in that position, but Royal here are going to start off Baron, actually, so they're, they're looking for it, and Avenger way down the bottom, again, of all the people to split push, maybe they don't want him to do it, Tabe may be going to look for an ultimate, but doesn't quite throw it out. if they had wards on the enemy red, of course, then they would have probably stuck on that Baron, but... They've been behind in this game, Royal. They don't have the war coverage down to be able to have the information about Twitch there to be able to pursue the Baron. Yeah, and Avenger waddles himself back over there towards the middle of the map. They're going to push up mid lane now, our LMQ. And just continue to try and keep some pressure here. Godlike going to take a little bit of damage. Stress looks for a hook, but doesn't quite get there. Does have an Oracles, though, so again, can create some vision there for LMQ. I mean, the bottom side is basically bare of wards. It makes sense, though, at this point, because, you know, around the 25-minute mark, Baron is really what's at a premium in terms of objectives that teams really, really want to get. So, you know, both teams have an Oracles. They're being grouped towards the middle and left side of the map here to make sure that doesn't go down. But there is always that threat of that bottom, and someone has to go down and push that wave up. But thankfully, it looks like the uh, blue minions are actually pushing. Oh, no, never mind. I got my colors mixed up. The blue minions are definitely pushing onto that inhibitor right now. And LMQ, if they ever do get the exclusive vision, because of course Royal has had all the pinks down for a long time here, they got double blade, the Ruin King, and the Javan attack speed buff. This Baron will explode. And they're going for it now as well. LMQ onto that Baron. 
Looking to get things done. Ari a little bit out of position, but forced to back off in there as well. Clearing out the wards. Knew that was spotted off there. So good reaction there from Royal, but again, all those blue minions stacking up towards the bottom. Going to make that inhibitor's life particularly unhappy. Somebody's going to be forced to recall here. And LMQ, if there was ever a time for them to do something, they need to force right now as that big minion stack hits the bottom wave. I mean, this is the opportunity they waited for, right? They can look for the hook. Tabe is forced to flash there. Can't quite land that one onto Thresh. White has gone back now as well. Does have Home Guard boots. are going to try and clear this out as much soon as she possibly can on Ari. But, I mean, LMQ... This is exactly LMQ the need to be decisive wanted. though, pastry time. I mean, they are winning. They do. Uh, they do have good map movement in terms of creeps. But if they just sit here and don't use this advantage, Royal are getting back into this game. It's still only less than a three k gold lead for LMQ. Yeah, almost being a little too careful. Looks like they are actually onto Baron. Although Thresh actually clearing out more wards here. I mean, doesn't really mind if he dies there. Baron, I think, is going to go over to LMQ here. They're just hanging out. Vision, they're going to get picked up by the Lantern there as well. I mean, Thresh just buying time for his teammates here. Zach can look for it though. Maybe he can get something done, but no, the Baron already down there. Thresh actually wanted to hook back towards his team onto Baron, but it died, and we're all going to get the his bad slight, news. His slight frustration with the lack of hook there. Probably going to be happy with the 300 gold on the Baron. Uh, I think so. And uh, Royal, they get the bad news just a little too late there as they throw the wards over the top to realize that, in fact, Baron is already down there for LM LMQ. So, you know, a little... Maybe a little indecisive there, but you know, still get it done very cleanly. Really just take that Baron without any threat of all at Royal and I like through. the positioning from Thresh there because it could have been two scenarios for it. It could have just been Thresh looking for a hook engage to kill someone, they'd take Baron, or they could have been on Baron. They didn't have the information. They made a judgment call, and Thresh really helped to look big, look scary, look like he wanted to pick up a hook. And at the end of the day, they got Baron for it. Yeah, cleared up vision, provided vision there as well. So if Royal were coming, they would have their exact movements and make you know make the best decision about whether to move off Baron or stay on it and finish it up there. You know, LMQ get what they want. They get the Baron buff that they really wanted to get since they've been pressuring that bottom inhibitor after that split push. So this game gets very interesting now for the next few minutes while Baron buff's on because LMQ obviously with Baron buff going to be looking to make some more fights. Can still send Zed somewhere there. Although it seems like Xiao Wei Zhao is more committed to actually team fighting at this point, which is sort of interesting. And I think for Royal here, I mean, they have two champions who have high mobility and have the ability to outplay, and those are the that's the Ari and the Vayne. Ari and Vayne in team fights here need to massively outplay their opponents because they're losing in terms of items. I mean, Blade of the Ruin King, Phantom Dance, a very nice call for Vayne, but we've already got Infinity Edge, Blade of the Ruin King, and Azeal completed on Twitch as he tries to work on a last whisper here. So in terms of a, a burst team fight, if they get the Ken initiation into, you know, the the follow up from Zed and Twitch. LMQ has to have fights, I think, unless we see some really, really slippery play from White Sanuzi. So, a lot of skill required in these team fights for World to stay in this game. White's backing off now as a godlike coming back. He's actually following around the back here, looking for the initiation, but Inhibitor is going to go down here. No, they're not going to let it. Tidal are going to come through. Godlike in the back, they're looking for it. White's in there as well, and there's this damage coming through here, but Dreams is in the front trying to shut it out. Jarvan in the back, that Cataclysm to defend off that Twitch. Tabe's going to pick up Zed, though, so that's one there. White's very low, going to go down in there as well, but Kill's still coming out there. Twitch does go down to Vayne though, which is really good news for Royal, and they're going to be able to play clean up here pretty comfortably, so a very nicely engineered fight there, got like over the top there, nowhere for Thresh to run, he's going to get taken out as well, looks like they might even just guild, give this kill to Uzi, and they will, they want to make sure that Vayne gets, gets as much farm as possible, and a 4 for 1 fight there with no name, the only escapee of that one, and really, you know, if there was ever a time to bait the enemy team into setting up a team fight for you in perfect positioning, that was it there, that was beautifully played by Royal. Yeah, and I was saying that it all relied on Whites and Uzi, and it was all about Whites there. He just did so much work, basically getting into the back line, and then the perfectly timed Zonyas. Twitch was caught in no man's land, because he was trying to kill Whites with, you know, his, uh, his spray and pray. But when Whites stopped, you know, used his Zonyas, he tried to focus the, the front line that was coming towards him, but he was kind of caught, you know, 700 units from uh, the opposite ends of the fight. He was just caught in the middle, was taken out. Smart, smart play from White and Uzi there, splitting focus on the the focus fight uh, targets for LMQ. Gets Royal the team fight victory. God like coming around the back, certainly working there as well. And that was a very, very perfectly timed tidal wave there from Tabe. So Royal, you know, knowing how important the inhibitor is to LMQ, knowing what they'd give up to try and take it out, kind of bait them into overextending there. And win a nice, decisive fight there. In fact. White's again going to come through here, try and take out Dreams, but just some damage coming through. Can't quite get the pick off there with the Charm, unfortunately, so they'll just be happy with AoEing down these minions and trying to buy more time for that Baron Buff to If In fact, it's one off on everyone because they all just died, except Jarvan, of course. He's still going to have it for a short while longer. And I guess this, this game is going to be the difference between highly mobile threats and 
AOE CC and kind of turret threats in terms of the fact that Twitch is going to be fairly anchored to one position and you know fighting in a thousand range. If they're able to split their two threats, if Vayne and Ari are never going to be able to cope with the same uh, auto attacks or by the same threats, if they can buy time for each other, they can really ruin a fight and win a fight here for Royal. But it just requires so much more skill than the kind of press R and run at them comp that we see from LMQ. I mean, to the credit there for Uzi, he's actually got a very smart pick here. You know, he definitely needs more damage, but he's actually got a Quicksilver Sash here to try and not only, you know, get out of some of that potential CC, but even just to drop Deathmark off himself from Zeta is really important. And Godlike's going to go in again. There's Let's Burns coming up. A great knock up there as well. The box activated in there from Thresh. Zed trying to get in there as well as Dreams is going to go back with the ultimate. But Ed is backing off here. Lucky taking a lot of damage. A little too much, actually, as he goes down. And there's a Cataclysm following up as well. But Uzi doing so much damage there. Picks one off. They need to do more damage. White's is still alive. The important members of Royal here still kicking here as Tabe trying to support it off. White's now going to go back in there as well. The ults come back off there. The damage coming through. A good Zonny's in there as well. Avenger popped up by the bubble. They need more damage, but the flay there is good to knock back Van. But Uzi cleanses off everything there with QSS and just stays alive. And now Godlike's back into the fight there, slows him up with Randy Wins. An amazing 5 for 1 fight there for Royal. Just a heroic performance from Whites and Uzi here, Pastry Time. They're playing so, so smartly. They're never grouping, they're never getting hit by AoE. They're splitting focus whenever someone's running towards them to ensure that the, at one at any point in the fight, one of the two is free hitting people with spells or auto attacks respectively. Fantastic player from Royals, two threats. And I have to go back and check, but I have a funny feeling Van QSS off Deadly Venom there, which is just insane. That's insane from Uzi there to, to escape with a minuscule amount of health. Life stealing back up there as well. With that Blade of the Rune King life steal. And now Whites and are getting pressure. frustrated based time because they've had two good engages there. And they've lost both fights. They're losing an objective here out with the inner turret. Royals just playing out of their socks to stay in this game. They really are. I mean, the gold lead now almost even at this point. There's 600 gold between these two teams. The most telling thing for me, though, Papa Smithy, look at the kill score. You know, the turrets are even. That's great. They've split most of the objectives with, of course, Baron. 13 and 3 15 is Ari and Vayne here, page time, and 18 8 overall. Royal are winning the fights. They have. I mean, the kills are obviously ahead for LMQ. Then it was kind of even back up. But that 10 kill lead here for Royal at this point in the game really shows that, as you said, they've been winning team fight after team fight. And it is credit to their AD carry and mid player at this point. And now Baron's going to be back up here. And Royal have to feel confident. Oh my goodness, sorry, just got a Rabidon's death cap. And it's one of those things where the three other members are all playing great. But literally, if White's or Vayne dies in the initial AoE or at the start of a fight, Royal's going to lose the fight. Neither of them can die early. And both of them are going to take all the aggro from the enemy team, but they're living through fight space due time. They are. They're finding a way to make sure they stay alive here. White's continuing to try and play aggressive. And again with Baron Buff back up on the way. Oracle's here as well. Everyone's trying to clear out some wards, looking for maybe a good position here for Zack. In fact, Slingshot's going to come through. Just gets Flay there, but the Tidal Web's going to come in as well. Unfortunately, Royal can't quite commit here. White's still going to go in there. A good Acrobis and lands up to no name. White's in the back there. Zonny's coming through. Let's bounce activated for Godlike as well. But Avenger in a great spot there picks up Tabi. Damage coming through for Dreams there as well. Godlike though taking a lot of damage there as he's going to soak it. But Ari is dead from Zed. Nunu's going to take him out in there as well. And that is uh, not good news, unfortunately. Uzi, the only one left alive. If he can do this 1v4, I'd be very impressed. And Baron is back up, I believe. So LMQ definitely have an opportunity here to make something happen. In fact, Twitch, I believe, is going vein hunting here as the rest of LMQ try and push up the mid. This could be a 1v1 here. Avenger's going to go in for the play of the rookie because that condemn not quite there for the stun. And that's a flash forward there from Twitch. The bush though, almost good though, but Avenger does find the shutdown. Only needed one last auto attack. And all of a sudden, LMQ only need one fight, but they're looking really good now as they push this bottom inhibitor. And if that wash wasn't, if that brush wasn't double watered by both teams, that would have been a vein outplay. Couldn't do it. They pick up the inhibitor here. Just Whites did fall early in that fight, and that changed the momentum completely. Yeah, it was just I saw you know Godlike go in. He's kind of gets his slingshot off, and Royal don't look don't really look like they want to follow up. The tidal wave comes through, and all of a sudden Whites decides, hey, I need to go in here. And I... it was a narrow corridor though, Page Time. It's the sort of place where if there's a rumble in the game, you're like, don't fight in a line there. And unfortunately, Twitch. Much like with the Equalizer, that Spray and Prey was doing AoE damage to many, many people. So it was just an unfortunate space. There wasn't the room for Uzi and Ari to both be kiting and using space. Ari was able to do it because she was in the clear, but Vayne was not able to. So they didn't have the same terrain they needed to win these fights, I think. No, not at all. The filthiest thing of all being with that Twitch positioning, he was actually behind the ridge that is directly in front of that long piece of brush, and he was just standing there spraying and praying people from 850 range. It was insane. So It's nice when the terrain peels for you. Yes! That's exactly what happened to Aventor. The rest of his team's in front of him, and he's happily standing there just gunning down people with his ultimate. So, 
Not a good fight there for Royal, unfortunately. Lose everyone there in that one. Thankfully did not lose Baron, but lose their bottom inhibitor. And now the pressure back on you. LMQ going to go for Baron for a second time here in this game. White's over near the blue buff. Looking to clear that one out. Definitely Ari would love to have blue here in this spot. And there's still room for Royal here. I mean, the gold lead's going to stretch back out to about 3,000 gold ahead once more for LMQ. But Royal have already proven that, you know, they can win at this deficit. That's not a big deal. It's just a matter of not losing too much of their base. And that bottom inhibitor is going to throw a spanner into the works here. Absolutely. If you're an LM, from an LMQ perspective, if you're going to have one inhibitor advantage, you want to have that bottom inhibitor for the purple team down just because the super minions are going to be pressuring the inhib the, the base, the polar opposite of Baron. It opens up a Baron advantage for LMQ. They can choose when they want to go to it. Because as you can see, super minions starting to stream into the royal base. Yeah, all the lands really pushing in here. Royal just kind of have to react to wherever LMQ are going. And uh, stick together. I mean, LMQ at this point roaming through the enemy jungle. They've still got their oracle, so they're clearing out wards where they can. I mean, really just trying to find a foothold here. And if anybody is out of position, they're going to get themselves picked off here. And you can even see Zach again around to the side there, just down the bottom. He's maybe looking for initiation here, but he will get spotted off here. We'll have to be very careful. Godlike kind of walks towards Ken and thinks about it. It's like, eh, maybe not. Maybe I don't want to do this anymore. But, I mean, Royal, they really just have to sit and wait. I mean, LMQ don't even have Baron at this point, but there's so much pressure there, as you can see. All the super minions coming through here. Well, they might even lose a, a, a Nexus turret here. It's getting really low. I always responded to it. They're pinging onto the turret here, not Baron, which is interesting to me. Uh, you know, I mean, if you take out the, uh, all the outer turrets and the T2 turrets, you definitely really kind of strangle the enemy back into their own base. So you obviously would like inhibitors or inhibitor turrets if you can get them and they still have bottom inhibitor which is nice but this for me LMQ opening up the space in the top having more vision on the side Vroom, as everyone jumps over to Baron <laughs> that was very fun I mean, having uh, having space on the side where Baron like where you need it most kind of that top half of the map yep. gives them the best opportunity and the best vision to take Baron out and there we go LMQ a very very clean Baron and I guess I do agree with you because they can shop now get a fresh oracles if the duration signs go down and now they can have the aggressive wards all over the Royal side of the map, and only in their base will Royal be able to feel safe. Yeah, and that's really what Royal are kind of, that's what they're up to at this point. They really just have to hang out and weather the storm for a couple minutes as Baron Buff comes through. And I mean, at this point, LMQ picking up so many items across the board, they're going to be able to do a lot, a lot here. And, you know, with Baron, they probably feel quite confident to go in and just dive here. I mean, everyone's full, more or less, in terms of items. There's three or four items on pretty much everyone on the LMQ side. And, you know, Royal, they've got the farm where they need it, but Baron Buff is a lot of extra effective gold in there as well. But I think, I do agree with you in terms of they do have the farm where they need it, but this is more of a season two kind of comp here. It's more of a two threat comp, you know, the sort of thing that CLG and A were really criticized for in the first split of the LCS this year. Because you only have, it, it's Vayne, Ari, and tanky supports. That's, that's, that's what this team comp comes down to. So if any threat gets killed in random AoE, or gets called out, or makes any misplay, if Wyatt or Uzi dies, they lose a team fight, they lose objectives, the game's over. Whereas on the LMQ side, Cannon's building damage, Zed's built a load of damage, and of course Twitch is an AD carry that hyper carries into the late game. So they have that one extra damage threat. And in Season 3, that's what you need. If you can have three to four damage threats, you're really feeling comfortable if you have a strong initiator. Royal actually all hanging out there. They were hoping someone was going to wander down the bottom lane. There was a lot of wards there set up for a potential bait there. I mean, it's almost desperation mode at this point for Royal. They really have to make something happen. And if anyone dies and a turret is left to push, Jarvan, Twitch, and Zed are going to do stupid amounts of damage to that turret. In fact, they even activate their locket to just get some extra turret hits in. I mean, it may die here on this next wave. And LM They do have a double locket, so they did have that flexibility. Oh, well. Double locket. How powerful. They could, just, they could do it again if they want to. And there we are. The tower goes down. Middle and hidden out under threat as well. Royal, if they're going to make it happen, they may want to make their stand here. They've only got a Nexus turret left as well, by the way. As the it feels like that was maybe the force point for Royal, in that they, even though... A fight was most likely going to be lost there. They couldn't really afford to lose a second inhibitor. No, and now, I mean, they've got their bottom one back, so they're still only one down. But you know the LMQ are coming in here. And if there is any time that Royal needs to go in, they're going to make it happen. God, like it, a look for the initiation. Goes in there. Let's bounce activated as well. Tidal wave coming through in there. And the box gets activated. But there's Dreams are not quite in position. Cataclysm off in there as well. White's in the back just trying to get some damage on there. As Uzi's doing so much damage there. Picks up Thresh. But still coming through. The Avenger's still alive as well as the ultimate pops off here. And a two, well, one for one trade, sorry. Looking good here. But Royal push back towards their base. LMQ take out another inhibitor down there in the bottom lane. And it may only be a matter of time here at this point. Again, Royal... They don't have their Zack anymore. That was their initiation to start things off. Now it's even harder for them to protect their two threats. And all the turret damage is still alive for LMQ as they get the top turret down. Yeah, losing Thresh for their uh, initiation there is certainly a trade that I think LMQ are happy with. 
And I mean, Zed and Twitch completely shredding down that turret. The only turret left now there, one Nexus turret left here. This last inhibitor left here as well. And Royal, they, they can make it happen to be a miracle, but I don't know. Looking sketchy here. Cannon's going to pee in at the turret, so that's the inhibitors down, but they may be going to look for a fight here instead of Avenger on top of Uzi that completely cleans him up. A good zone is there from White's, a decent bubble in there as well, but Royal, basically nothing they can do here at this point. Even if all of LMQ dived into the fountain and died, the super minions might be able to clean it up here, and Royal are just dying left, right, and center. Everybody from LMQ is still alive, and in, I guess what you called the upset, they are going to take this game here, and good game, but well played. LMQ take it over Royal. And that's their first big scalp of the tournament. You'll remember last season, everyone was talking about when Livermore, say Livermore, overcame World Elite with their split push Shaco. Um, that was a very famous game from the first split of the LPL. They take down Royal here just with a really nice comp. And it felt like Royal, they had it back in their hands, you know, when Ari and Vayne were just playing so smartly, so well in those um, open team fights, you know, in large areas. Then that one fight in the constricted area near the inner turret for. LMQ, they just, it feels like that just gave the three threat LMQ team one more damage item, one more piece of strength, and uh, they never look like losing afterwards. So GG well played, an upset for sure, but LMQ, they get their third win on the board. They do, are looking good here early on in the LPL. That, of course, is uh, halfway through the week through day two coverage if you want to catch it. Uh, all, the, all the games from yesterday, or of course, the rest of the games from today, feel free to head over to youtube.com slash lolchamp series, and we'll be back. We're going to have our last few games here, week three, day two, Tencent LPL Summer, coming back.